What's up guys, Sagi here and welcome to another Tech Gear Talk. Today I'm gonna to show you how I rigged out my Canon SL3 for unlimited recording, better handling, professional audio, enough power to last me all day and even improved lighting. Now some people overlook the SL3 because it's an entry level DSLR camera, but Canon snuck in a couple of features that make it quite powerful. So while it does have some limitations which I discuss in my full review up in the corner, this rig has got me some fantastic results. I'm gonna take you step by step through each component, I'll tell you why I chose to use it, and I'll also include some additional options at different price points in the description. All right, so let's get going. In order to start out building a kit, we need a cage. And I chose this small rig cage as my base. It's designed to fit the SL3, which is also called the 250D or the 200D Mark II, and it also fits my SL2 or 200D. Like every cage, it attaches to the body of the camera with a quarter 20 at the bottom, but with this cage, small rig added a secondary attachment point on the top left, which slides in through the strap mount. And once you tighten both of the screws, the fit is extremely tight and the camera doesn't slide around at all, which is a problem that I've had with some other cages. And by the way, I'll put links in the description to every component I talk about so that you can easily find them. Now, I love that this cage has both quarter 20 and 3 8 inch holes all the way around, which gives me tons of options as far as mounting accessories. There are two cold shoe mounts, one on the right and one on the left, and there are several quarter 20s and one 3 8 hole on the bottom, so you can easily attach the cage to a quick release plate if you wanna mount the whole thing on a tripod. It was also really important to me that the cage won't block any of the the functionality of the camera. So you can see that I could still access the buttons, dials, and ports, the battery compartment, the memory card slot, and I still have complete range of motion on the fully articulating touchscreen. I also like the fact that it protects the camera whenever I put it down or just in case I happen to bump it against something. And another real life example is if I wanna put the camera on the ground to get a low angle shot or a reflection and the ground might be a little wet, I know that it's not gonna damage the body because the cage is protecting it. Another bonus about this cage is that it helps me when I try to use the SL3 with some bigger lenses on a gimbal. It raises the camera a bit so the larger lenses won't hit the quick release plate. And it also lets me attach counterweights without having the need for a special plate. This can make balancing the camera a lot easier. Next, I wanted to improve the handling and stability of the rig, so I added a side handle. And in this case, I'm using a small rig wooden universal side handle. I mounted it to the right side because the SL3 is a fully articulating touchscreen which extends to the left. This handle is very well made, it's super comfortable to hold, and it looks really nice. There's something about adding wood grain to all this matte black that I really like. This handle also has a cold shoe mount, a few extra quarter 20s, and a 3 8 inch mount at the top. It attaches to the cage using these two thumb screws, and you can get them pretty tight by hand, but to really get them tight, it helps to use a hex screw. And Small Rig has a super clever design where they built a spot for the Allen wrench right into the handle. And it's also magnetic, so there's no chance of it falling out and you losing it. And this way you always have it when you need it. Now, once you attach the handle, you'll see that as soon as you start handling the rig with the side handle, you'll immediately get more stable footage and smoother camera movement. Next, there were a number of reasons why I wanted to add a top handle. I wanted to be able to just quickly grab the rig off of a tripod or use this when I'm just carrying the rig around. I also wanted to be able to get low angle shots and I wanted more versatility in terms of how I can handle the rig for B-roll. So this small rig top handle works great. Again, there's an additional cold shoe mount and tons of quarter 20 and 3 8 threaded holes. And I'll show you how I use this cold shoe later on in this video. So now that I have handling all taken care of, the next thing I wanted to address is audio. And if you watched any of my audio related videos, then you know that whenever possible, I like to avoid using the built-in microphone on any camera. There are just several issues with any built-in microphone. So first, they're always so tiny. So they can only do so much. And realistically, high-end audio components are just not a priority for camera manufacturers because relatively small segments of their audience actually uses them. So they spend their money on things like better image quality, better ISO performance, and improved dynamic range. Finally, and probably my biggest issue with any on-camera microphone is that it has to be as far away from the subject as the camera, and it doesn't have the pickup pattern that's designed to focus on the subject. With the SL3 in this particular setup, there are a few different microphones that I use depending on the situation. So if I'm running and gunning and I want the most 
most portable solution where I'm always ready to go. One of my favorite microphones is the Rode VideoMic Pro Plus. It's super compact for the quality of audio that you get, and it comes with a built-in Ryko Lyre shock mount, which isolates the microphone from the camera movement and then prevents camera handling noise from traveling up to the mic. This is a shotgun microphone with a super cardio pickup pattern, meaning that it's gonna focus on sounds coming from the front of the camera, and it's gonna reject sounds coming from the side and the back. So I just attach it to the cold shoe mount on the left side of the cage, and I'm all set. And I use this microphone a lot because it has some really great features like auto on off, two low pass filters, a high pass boost, an incredibly important plus 20 dB option. And this lets me turn the gain down on the SL3 and then have the microphone amplify the sound instead of counting on the SL3's preamps. I also have a video comparing all the Rode video mics. So if you're interested in hearing the differences, I'll link to it up in the corner. All right, so the next option is if I have a subject that's moving around or I can't can't get close enough to get good audio because of how the shot is framed, I would usually go with the Rode Wireless Go. This is one of my favorite wireless setups right now because it's just so small and light. It has two components, a transmitter which will be clipped to the subject, then a receiver which will be attached to the cage and then wired into the 3.5 mic input jack on the SL3. What's great about this small kit is that you don't need a lavalier microphone because the transmitter has a microphone built in. Now, if you don't want the transmitter to show up in your video, then you can actually plug in a lavalier microphone into the transmitter and then you're all set. And what I really like about this setup is that even if I'm not always the same distance away from my subject or if they turn to the side, the microphone is essentially moving with them and I'm getting consistent, clean and crisp audio. Another similar option which actually has more features is the Comica Boom XU. And this actually gives me two transmitters and one receiver so I can record two people at the same time. Also comes with lavalier microphones for each transmitter so I don't have to pay extra for them. And I'll create a comparison between the two systems to help you choose. All right, so we have handling and audio and now I wanted to add unlimited recording and improved user experience. Now the SL3 already has a fully articulating screen so I can always have it pointed at me whether I'm behind the camera, in front, above, below, or even to the side. But sometimes it's nicer to see things on a large larger screen, so having an external monitor is really nice. But unlike with my M50 rig, the SL3 has a clean HDMI output, so instead of using just a monitor, which is an option, I decided to use the Atomos Ninja 5. This is both an amazing monitor and an external recorder, meaning that I can get clean signal from the SL3 feed it into the Ninja 5 and then record onto the SSD. Now this removes the recording limit from the SL3 and now lets me record for as long as I have space on this SSD. I'm using a one terabyte Samsung which gives me hours and hours of continuous recording depending on the resolution and quality. Now one misconception about external recorders is that they will always improve the quality of the footage. So this Atomos Ninja 5 for example can record 4K 10-bit HDR or 4K 12-bit RAW but it can only record in the bit depth and chroma sampling that the camera is sending. In our case, according to my conversation with Canon, the SL3 records 8-bit 420 internally and externally, meaning that regardless of the capabilities of the Atomos, that will be the information that's being recorded. Now think of it this way, if the camera can output 8-bit, which is 16.78 million colors. There's no way for the Atomos to change it to 10-bit, which is over a billion colors, because those colors were simply not part of the original feed. Now, some cameras can output a higher quality feed externally than what they can record internally. And in that case, using something like the Atomos Ninja 5 will give you better quality than recording to the SD card. And if this is confusing, let me know and I'll create a dedicated video where I discuss this in more detail. Now the Ninja 5 can record in ProRes, which will create larger files, but ones that are easier for your computer to edit. So if you're filming in 1080p and you're not having any issues with editing, it's probably not worth it. But if you're shooting in 4K and your computer is struggling to edit the files, you may like this option. Now, in addition to being an external recorder and a beautiful, accurate, and bright monitor, the Ninja 5 also provides some super valuable exposure and white balance tools like false color and waveforms. I can also actually upload LUTs if I wanna shoot in a flat color profile like CineStyle or ProLost, but I wanna see what it will look like after I apply a LUT. And I can do that right in the Atomos. So if you watched any of my cinematic look tutorials, I talk about shooting in a flat color profile so you get more detail in the shadows and the highlights. Now the issue is that it doesn't really look great on the monitor because it's really washed out. 
So being able to apply LUT in the recorder solves that issue because it's not actually changing the file that I'm recording. It's just showing me on the back of the screen what the flat file will look like with the correction LUT applied. Now, another bonus that we get when we're using a recorder is that it has a headphone jack. So in addition to audio levels on the screen, we can plug in a pair of headphones and monitor audio in real time. And this is a great feature, especially for a camera like the SL3 that doesn't have a headphone jack. And actually, the more I talk about the Ninja 5, I really just need to do a dedicated video because it's such a powerful tool. And it's not cheap, it's 500 bucks plus the price of the SSD, but it does add unlimited recording, some powerful new features, and something that you can use with future cameras. Now next I'm gonna tell you about some of my favorite lenses. And the one that I use most often, not just with the SL3, but with any camera that accepts it, is the Sigma Art 18 to 35 f1.8. It's actually the lens that I'm using to record this video, and obviously I have a second one because I use it so often. Now you're probably already familiar with this lens, but I just love the image and build quality. It's a super fast lens that opens up to f1.8, which gives us that shallow depth of field and also makes it a great lens in low light. It's an EF mount lens, so of course I don't need any adapters or anything like that. Now, if I need to go even wider, I usually throw on a 10 to 18, which is another great value, and lets me go really, really wide. Now, if you want some more options, I do have an SL2 lens video, which I'll link to up in the corner and in the description. And since they have the same mount, the same lenses will work on both cameras. Right here, I'm using the 50 millimeter F1.8 and Nifty 50. I also have a video about this lens. Again, I think it's such a good value for like $125 new. This is a great lens for portraits and for video, again, especially if you need low light performance. Now, if I feel like I wanna take the next level, of course I can use all my L-series Canon glass, which all natively fit on the SL3. All right, so let's move on from lenses and talk about lighting. When I'm shooting in low light, or if I just wanna separate my subject from the background and I don't have the studio lights with me, I use the Godox R1. For portability and versatility, this is my go-to light right now. It's extremely bright at full power and it's dimmable from zero to 100% using the dial on the side. There is an LCD screen on the top so I can easily see the battery power, the intensity, and the color temperature. In CCT mode, I can select the color temperature between 2500 and 8500 K depending on whether I need warmer or cooler light. I can also switch to HSB mode which lets me select 360 different colors and then different levels of saturation and brightness for each. This is great when I want to add a splash of color and it's one of the reasons I use these lights when I shoot some of my B-roll. I have three of these lights and they charge using a USB-C cable. The battery lasts a really long time. If I ever need to, I can charge them while I'm using them. With this particular setup, I added an articulating magic arm with double ball heads to one of the quarter 20s on the wooden handle. This lets me position the light at various angles and also pushes it off to the side, which gives me less flat lighting. The R1 also helps brighten up my subject and gives it that extra pop and separation from the background, or can even provide some fill light. There's also a magnetic diffuser that I just snap on and actually does a really good job at diffusing the light and making it much softer and more flattering. Now moving on, I wanna talk a little bit about the SD cards that I use with the SL3 if I record internally rather than with the Atomos Ninja 5. I've been using the SanDisk Extreme Pro 128 gigabyte cards for as long as I can remember, pretty much with all of my cameras, and they work great. Now, some of the ones that I have are a little bit older and slower. They still work great with the SL3, and there are now newer and faster ones that actually cost less than what I paid when I got mine. So I'll put some links in the description. But again, even with the old speed, I've never had any issues with the SL3. Now I'm always going to tell you to get more memory cards than you think you need because it's so important to have backup. Also, I recommend keeping extra cards, even if they're smaller capacity ones in your bag, just in case you get somewhere, you realize you forgot your card or that it's full or something happened to your card. You're never stuck without one and you're always good to go. I think that we're all investing money in our gear. And even if this only saves you one time, like ever, it was still totally worth it. And I'm gonna finish by again, encouraging you to invest in good memory cards. All this gear doesn't mean anything if you use a cheap card and then lose all your data. And speaking of backup, let's talk a little bit about extra batteries. So the SL3 is known for having fairly good battery life. So normally, it's not something that I worry about. I have a video where I show you how to overcome the poor battery on the M50. 
and I use a similar solution to improve the SL3 power options. One of the solution is just to have additional batteries, and I'll link to a few third-party options that I use, which have worked great for me and have saved me a lot of money. But when I go out to film for hours, I just don't wanna deal with changing batteries at all. So what I do is I use the Power Junkie and a USB coupler. And basically the Power Junkie is this little adapter that uses Sony NPF batteries to power other gear. So I can use one of these batteries, I got two of them for $37, and each one of them has almost five times the battery life of the SL3's LPE17 battery. So I use the USB coupler from my battery life video and I plug it into the Power Junkie, grab one of these batteries, and then I'm set for hours when I'm on the go. And of course, these NPF batteries come in different sizes. So this is the medium size. If I don't need as much power, I can get a smaller one. If I need even more power, I have one that's twice this size. All right, so that's how I rig my SL3 for unlimited video recording, and I found that this setup produced excellent results for me. I would love to know how you set yours up, and I'm always happy to learn and get new ideas from you guys. I'll put links in the description to all the products that I talked about in this video, as well as some of my favorite lenses because there's always specials and discounts and those links will be automatically updated with the lowest pricing. I really hope I was able to give you some good ideas about how you can set up your Canon SL3 for video. If I did, please let me know by giving this video a thumbs up, tweet it, share it, and if you haven't yet, join the community by hitting the subscribe and notification buttons. You can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Tech Gear Talk. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon. All right, so let's get to the bonus material here. And I think I'm gonna start doing this at the end of my videos where I just continue to talk a little bit more about this product. So one of the questions I got about my other rig video was how heavy it is. And you know, it is, it's definitely adding weight to just the camera. So if your idea is to get the smallest and lightest rig that you can, then this is not it. Obviously we're adding weight, but with that added weight, we're getting a ton of functionality. So if you don't need this functionality, don't do this. But if you wanna start with a lower cost body, add lenses to it, get great audio, get unlimited recording, get lighting, better handling, then I think the way I look at it, it's okay that we're adding a little bit of weight or even like a medium amount of weight. I wouldn't say this is a lot of weight. And I think with the way that I have the cables all zipped, I think it's still pretty small and manageable and it is really comfortable to hold. Like I said, even if you're hand holding it, you're just introducing some camera movement, you're gonna see that it's a lot more stable than when you're trying to hold a very light camera. And another point that was brought up in one of the other videos is that this is really adding a lot of cost to a lower cost camera. And I totally get that. But honestly, for the functionality that we're getting, it's really not that bad. Like this is still less expensive than my cheapest cinema camera that I bought like five years ago. So you have unlimited recording, unlimited with Canon, unlimited, because they refuse to do it in camera for some reason, I don't know, maybe it's some tax law in the EU that's still happening or not. I don't know why they're doing it, but we can't get unlimited recording for some reason. So now we can. All right, if you're still watching this, I think that's pretty good. If you have any questions, let me know in the comment section. See you in the next video.